Um, in the video, they talk about how you can keep the commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, the Bible doesn't show our ability. It shows our inability. The Bible says that the law came in that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. That there's none righteous, no, not even one. And the law reveals that. The law reveals that there's none righteous. And so let's go ahead and go here. This is this is their about section on the YouTube. Let's see. Okay, here it says about the Living Church of God. So we're going to their website. Say about us. And what we believe. Let's go to this. We're going to get right to the heart of this. Okay, the gospel. Salvation. Salvation is God's gift by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Upon repentance and baptism, God justifies us from our past sins. Okay, we already got a problem here. Upon repentance and baptism, God justifies us. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible says we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works, works of the law. That a person has a non-guilty verdict by their faith apart from any performance to any works that they do. Um, you see, he's saying upon repentance... And we're going to see what he means by that. If he means repentance of sins, then he's talking about a relationship to the law that in order to be saved, you have to keep the law to some measure. You have to keep the law to some measure in order to be justified. So if that's what he's saying, that upon keeping the law to some measure and being baptized, God justifies us of our past sins. Notice our past sins. In other words, they don't believe God's justified us from our future sins, that the blood of Christ hasn't cleansed us from all sin as in past, present, and future. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 says, By one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. That by one single offering, what Jesus did on the cross, shedding his blood, he's perfected us forever in the sight of God. That's why the Bible says he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So what Christ did on the cross for us is he made us holy in God's sight. He reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ by the death of his body that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So we are without blemish and free from accusation. If that only lasted for five minutes and then we could corrupt that and we could tarnish what God has done, then it wouldn't mean anything because everyone would tarnish what God has done. There's none righteous, no, not one. So if it was dependent upon us to maintain God's holiness, it would never happen. So we get a once and for all holiness, according to the Bible, not a 10 minute holiness or a five minute or a, or a five year holiness. We get a once and for all holiness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says, by his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So once and for all, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once and for all, we are holy in God's sight because of what God has done. So when people say that upon repentance and baptism, that God justifies us of our past sins, they're making their boast in something else other than the cross. They're making their boast in their keeping of the law, repentance, and baptism. So that's their boast of why their sins are their past sins god justifies them from their past sins because of these things not because of the cross notice their boast isn't in the cross paul said may i never boast except in the cross of christ through who which the world has been crucified to me and i to the world because it was on the cross that god made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of god in him and that righteousness, according to the Bible, is an eternal, everlasting gift. The Bible says, if those who receive the abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness, they'll reign in this life. So it says that righteousness is a gift. And a few chapters later, it says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. So once God gives you this righteous gift, he never takes it away. But that happened as a result of the cross and Jesus dying on the cross. And that's what's absolved us of our sins, not only our past sins, but our future sins. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. But you can see their boast isn't in the cross. Their boast of why their sins are absolved is because of repentance and baptism. So it says, we then go on, we then begin on 
the ongoing process of being saved. So anytime people talk about salvation as a process shows that they don't understand the gospel because the Bible says by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So by grace we have been saved, the Bible says, not that we will be saved or we're being saved. What happens is, is people, when they say that the verse that says being saved, like the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. And people have formed a whole doctrine out of that, being saved as though salvation is a process. But all Paul is saying is that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, that throughout time, when people hear the gospel, those that are perishing, it's foolishness to them. But to those who are being saved throughout time, it's the power of God unto salvation, that those who hear the gospel throughout time, they're being saved through it. It's the power of God and the salvation of those people. But it's not saying that, you know, salvation is a process. Again, people read into the text their false doctrines that they you know, want to believe that they're being saved through some performance. So this idea of being saved is not that um, you're saved when you believe, but you're saving yourself on an ongoing process. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. Not might have, not could have, not possibly have, but has everlasting life. In other words, they're saved. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Not might have, not could have, not possibly have, but has everlasting life. They shall not come into the judgment that pass from death to life. So Jesus says the one who believes has passed from death to life. They have eternal life and they shall not come into the judgment, which means they are saved. When the apostles were asked, what must we do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. They didn't say, well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be on the process of being saved. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, you're saved. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And you can see the reason why they have this language of being saved that they're using is because they believe it's upon your obedience to repentance and baptism by which you're ultimately justified in the sight of God. Scripture says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That having been justified, past tense, a non-guilty verdict, we have a peace toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ, not through our baptism, not through our repentance, do we get justification or peace toward God. Our salvation will be complete at the resurrection. In observing the biblical festivals and Sabbaths, we come to understand more deeply God's plan of salvation and steps toward salvation that we can take as Christians. So, again, they believe that salvation is, is something that people do. It's dependent upon their works, upon their obedience, uh, festivals, Sabbaths. And anytime they bring up Sabbaths, these uh, churches and stuff, and they think that you have to keep these Sabbaths, shows that they're not actually keeping the real Sabbath. Jesus is our Sabbath, and the Bible says there for remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So let us be diligent to enter into that rest, for he who has entered into that rest has ceased from his works as God did from his. So let us be diligent, lest we fall after the same example of disobedience. So people that don't rest from their works and they go to try to uh, do works like Sabbaths and festivals, and they think that this is going to eventually give them rest, are not actually resting in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come to me all you are heavy laden, heavy burden, I will give you rest, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. So Jesus said that he will give us rest when we come to him. So he is our rest. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. It's not a, a particular day that we have to keep on a regular basis by, by which then eventually we will find rest. That's a work by which we're trying to work to eventually get rest. But the Bible says, let us be diligent to enter in that rest, for he who's entered that rest has ceased from his works as God did from his. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we we cease from trusting and putting faith in our works as any measure of what's going to save us. These people haven't done that. They're actually trusting in their baptism, their repentance, their Sabbaths, their festivals. This isn't trusting in Jesus. This is trusting in themselves. 
And what they're doing is they're putting baptism, repentance, festivals, and Sabbaths to an equal ultimacy of what the cross of Christ has accomplished. In other words, Jesus can die on the cross all he wants, but unless you do these things, unless you get baptized, unless you repent, unless you do the festivals on the Sabbath, unless you do these things, Jesus can die all he wants, but you won't be saved. You have to do these things. In other words, they're raising this to an equal measure of what the cross of Christ has provided, which is holiness. By his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. If you deny the once and for all holiness that comes through the cross of Christ, then you will indirectly or implicitly be boasting in some other measure of performance or something else by which you believe that you're making yourself holy, that you're making yourself right, whether it's baptism, repentance, festivals, or Sabbaths. So this is very common with false teachings that they raise the other things up to equal ultimacy of the cross of Christ. That unless you get baptized, unless you repent, unless you keep these Sabbaths, you can believe in Jesus dying on the cross for your sins all you want. It won't matter. It won't have any effect unless you do these things. So in other words, these things are just as important as Jesus dying on the cross. That's what they're giving by implication that, you know, you can believe in Jesus Christ dying on the cross again all you want, but it will not matter because unless you do these things, get baptized and repent and do these Sabbaths, then you won't be saved. So they're raising your works and what you do to the equal ultimacy of what Christ did on the cross. Uh, absolutely blasphemous. Jesus said it was finished on the cross, and when we believe on him, we have eternal life the moment we believe according to Scripture. These things are right to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, not thank or hope or wish it's a possibility, or you'll find out when you get there. But these things are right to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see the steps towards salvation. The first important step towards salvation is coming to a complete faith in God and in Christ's sacrifice. Peter said, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Notice how it's double talk. They say, you know, have complete faith in God's sacrifice. But then they add in their baptism. So faith in the complete sacrifice isn't really enough. You have to have this baptism to actually be saved. So this is what they constantly do, too, is double talk. False teachers constantly are doing this, that they act like, oh, yeah, I have faith and, uh, you know, 100 percent faith in the sacrifice, but then add in other things. And you can see here repentance, a vital step towards salvation is repentance of sin, uh, repentance of transgressing God's law. So sin is transgression of the law. And so what they're saying is that a vital step towards your being saved is that you need to keep the law. But the Bible says, brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to another, that is him who's been raised from the dead, in order that you might bear fruit to God. So the Bible says we have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, not that we have this living relationship to it by which we have to keep it as a vital means of salvation or to be made right with God. The Bible says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have his righteousness and the law has come to its end. But you can see in this situation, if salvation, a vital step of it is repenting of sin, then the law hasn't come to its end for these people. And it's just, begin, it's just ramping up and they've got to keep it. Acts chapter 13, verse 39 says, Through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things through which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. So according to the Bible, we've been freed from the law of Moses, not that we have this ongoing regimental program by which we have to keep the law as a vital part of salvation. The law was a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ, but once you've been justified by faith, a non-guilty ver verdict, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. Notice they're just trying to bring people under the schoolmaster. It's very common, too, with false teachers that they never actually deal with the functionality of the law. They never actually deals, deal with what it entails in its totality. And so they just, you know, never deal with verses that tell us how we've died to law, we've been freed from law, we're not under law, and laws come to its end.
So it goes on to say, Peter was inspired to command, repent, and be baptized, every one of you. Since every human being has sinned, and the penalty of sin is death, each sinner must turn from breaking God's law and be willing to obey his maker through Christ living within him. So here's why they say that, um, you know, you have to keep the law again, you know, that to be obedient, you're going to have to be obedient to keeping God's commands and his laws. But in Galatians, it says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth through whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed as crucified. This one thing I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the keeping of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So he who supplies the spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the keeping of the law or by the hearing of faith? So Paul goes to great lengths to tell the Galatians that they're bewitched, that they're foolish, that they're not obeying the truth because they're going back to the law by which they're believed they're being made perfect through means of performance in the flesh to the law. That's why he goes to great lengths in a rhetorical way twice to say, did you receive the spirit by the keeping of law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, did you become right with God because you kept the law or because you heard the gospel? Because it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That Abraham believed God and that was what made him right before God. God gave him a righteousness that was not his own. Abraham believed God and it was accredited him for righteousness. That he was credited righteousness that wasn't his own by the faith that he had in the one who was righteous, that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Abraham looked forward to that perfect sacrifice just as we look back to it. So it's very clear here that what these people are doing is what the foolish Galatians did. A lot of people do is they trust in the law. They're not trusting in Christ. They're, they're trying to mix law and grace, old wine with new wine, old leaven with new leaven. So there's actually enough here to see that this is already a radical. And once you see that someone is not teaching the true gospel, but teaching a false gospel, you should turn away from those type of people. See here, and the next step, vital step to salvation is water baptism. So a vital step for you meriting salvation is your water baptism. Um, you know, just God's grace, receiving the Holy Spirit. Through God's dynamic spirit, we can keep his commands. You, know, you didn't see Paul saying that he could keep his commands with God's spirit. He said, I know in me that is in my flesh no good thing dwells, for the willing to do good is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I cannot find, but the evil that I hate that I practice. So I see there's a law in my members waging war against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin and death. So with my mind I serve the law of God and my flesh I serve the law of sin. So this is just, you know, very common pharisaical teaching that you know, God is giving us his spirit not to, to believe in his son as a perfect sacrifice, but so that we can keep the commandments and then to begin to trust in our own performance and our own obedience. It's just it's not you know, biblical. According to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of hands, Christ, the apostles and elders. So they believe that you get the Holy Spirit not because you've believed in the gospel, but because these people lay their hands on you to pray that you'll get it. But the Bible says, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, that when we heard the gospel of our salvation, in whom also having believed, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It, it wasn't what these people did. So again, this is a cultic organization. They're, they're clearly showing themselves um, to be that. And that's what's so good about these statements of faith that they, that are produced. You can just quickly look at them and and discern from the scripture that this isn't uh, a true gospel and these aren't Christians. So God bless you guys. Peace to you. Take care and I hope your day is going good. Then I got me down.